Hi everybody, today we are going to talk about um, one of the most common uh, hemodynamic measurements uh, to define coronary flow in the cath lab. It's called fractional flow reserve. Unlike any other testing, the name itself does not explain the procedure because there is no mention of coronary artery, there is no mention of pressure, things like that that we will be doing this test. So unlike we talk about transesophageal echocardiogram, you know we're looking at the heart through um, a transesophageal route. Uh, similarly, if you have other tests in, in, the, in the cardiology, the name kind of gives you a description, but this fractional flow reserve, FFR, is a fancy name. The name itself does not explain a whole lot about the procedure, so we will be talking about this. Um, it's going to be important in internal medicine, especially if you're taking care of patients who, who go to the cath lab and, and they come back, you look at their, their cath report and you see, oh, the, the interventional cardiologist did some fancy measurements like FFR and this will kind of give you an idea what it means. General cardiology board, they will have few questions on that and interventional cardiology for sure. So with that, we just quickly go on to the fractional flow reserve. So looking at the picture A here, uh, and this is kind of a diagram of a coronary artery. This is LED, and uh, you're basically looking at this stenosis here. And you are trying to define whether this obstruction is causing any blood flow um, impairment to the myocardium. When we are doing an angiogram, most of the time we anatomically look at the, the stenosis and we define it whether it's 80 percent, 90 percent. But there come a point where you are kind of torn in between if it is a borderline lesion, whether it's causing hemodynamic significance or decrease uh, flow through the coronary. With this, we, I just quickly go on to this picture C here. Uh, a very famous, a very uh, important graph here, which kind of tells you about the physiology of the coronary blood flow. If this y-axis is your coronary blood flow, and then the x-axis is your stenosis. Um, if you look at this blue line here, you see the flow into the coronary artery. And it's been shown again and again in animal model as well as hemodynamically invasive testing that the coronary blood flow does not get compromised until you reach a stenosis of about 70%. There are a lot of things happen in the coronary arteries endothelial release of nitric oxide, it is a diastolic flow, more flow into the coronary when the people um, or when the patient is exercising. All these things kind of compensate even if you have a blockage of 30-40%. But it's the 70% mark where the when you have a coronary artery lesion with a stenosis of about 70%, that's when the coronary circulation is compromised. So this is very important and this is what the basic idea of, of doing this invasive testing, hemodynamic testing to kind of define whether the, the, um, the stenosis is flow limiting or not. With this, we come back here to picture A. As I said, this is the patient's um, getting a left heart catheter. There's a catheter sitting in you know, the left main and you see a blockage, which is you call it about like 70%. Now you have to define whether it is significant or not. And then, as I said, the way we do that is measuring the FFR. FFR is not something new. It is, you know, um, you might not know about it unless you are a physicist or you have very keen interest in physics because, as I said, the name itself does not explain the test. So basically, uh, about 30, 40 years ago, uh, with using simple physics formula, it was defined that if you have pressure measurements across a stenosis, you can define if that stenosis is causing any compromise of blood flow. So with this, I'll just put a little box here. FFR is equal to PD, which is a pressure distal to the lesion, divided by pressure proximal to the lesion. And for the sake of completion, just remember that the value we are looking at if it is less than 0.80, that means the lesion is significant. 
it needs either a stenting or it needs a, like a bypass in these patients and this was confirmed again again by the FAME trial very famous trial and then again the FAME 2 trial and so that's why it is a gold standard in coronary intervention if somebody's got a stenosis and if it is FFR positive that needs intervention if it is FFR negative no matter how bad it looks on the angiographic films you know um, you you will be held responsible if you intervene on that if the FFR is negative so you when you once you decide to do FFR then you better believe it again another thing I just do that here is uh, put star here it is a dimensionless or unitless measurement why is that because you are dividing pressure by pressure so the units are mer millimeter of mercury divided by millimeter of mercury so that kind of cancels so all you get is a ratio so with this we're going to come back to here picture b here this is the catheter in the coronary artery you see a stenosis here let's call this about 70 percent stenosis and now as i said you want to measure the ffr in this patient and as we know the formula the pressure distal divided by pressure proximal gives you the ffr and how do we do that so what we do that is by putting a, a coronary wire and the tip of that coronary wire has a piezoelectric crystal that's that transduces the pressure so that wire has a piezoelectric crystal and within this wire coronary wire there are electrical cords going in and then the it goes to the computer where it tells you the pressure distal to the lesion and then as i said the catheter is engaged in the coronary and this catheter transduces the pressure proximal so for for example let's say if the proximal pressure is 100 millimeter of mercury and the distal pressure is 90 millimeter of mercury if we plug this in into that pd over pp formula of ffr so it's going to be 90 over 100.9 so that means this lesion is not significant let's get another patient if the proximal pressure is 100 millimeter of mercury and the distal pressure is 70 millimeter of mercury now again you put this in the ffr equation distal pressure is 70 proximal pressure is 100 you have a ffr of 0 0.70 meaning this blockage here is significant and it needs intervention so far things are simple but there is one caveat so while you are measuring the distal pressure you have to take into consideration the capillary system because we know the arterioles and the capillaries they have the resistance so they're gonna be having some resistance and that might elevate the distal pressure so you have to take this out of the equation you have to take this resistance out of the equation and that's only then the proximal pressure will be equal to the distal pressure so the way we do that in the cath lab is by giving adenosine so as we know adenosine causes coronary vasodilatation so what it will do it will probably theoretically decrease the pressure here or the resistance in the capillaries down to zero and this is what we call like a hyperemia so if you look at that cath report they will say well the patient had ffr after maximum hyperemia after giving adenosine and this is what they are trying to do they are decreasing this capillary resistance down to zero and with this a lot of assumptions as i said and some formulas cancelling some of the equations and variables all you are left with as i said back here ffr is equal to distal pressure divided by the proximal pressure and if the ffr is less than 0 0.80 this is significant and that needs intervention let's come to the picture e here this is how the waveform looks like in the cath lab so the red line is your AO pressure and then the blue line is your FFR pressure waveform. Here if you see these beads, one, two, three, four, you see that these two kind of waveforms correlate with each other with their systolic and diastolic pressure. And then once you start with adenosine, 
and the protocol is that you have to give the adenosine for two minutes to kind of see that maximum hyperemia or or as we said the the coronary vasodilatation so that the capillary resistance is down to zero what i want you to look at that is this slope down here this is called the diastolic drift so basically the distal pressure measured by this piezoelectric crystal on the wire most of the time we will see this diastolic pressure will go down and that kind of makes sense because we know that the coronary circulation is dependent um, on the diastole so the coronary fill during that diastolic phase of the um, of the heart cycle so that's that's kind of how it will look on the monitor um, and then as i said it's going to be the computer giving you the number um, by measuring the distal pressure and the proximal pressure so with that there has been a lot of new advancement uh, I'll, I'll have you look at this picture d here i won't go into detail but now they have come up with what we call like an ifr ifr is instantaneous flow resolve so basically a variant of ffr so they have kind of confirmed or validated it against the ffr the whole idea is we know that the, some of the patients who get uh, this FFR, if you have to give them adenosine, if they have severe COPD, asthma, or, or multivessel disease, or, or any allergies to adenosine or heart blocks, you might not be able to give them the adenosine. So they come up with this neat idea where you can have the same form of same thing, same concept that you're measuring the pressure distally and proximally, but instead of giving adenosine to decrease the capillary resistance, you are looking at the physiology of the heart and the flow in the coronary circulation. So basically, if you look at this diagram here in D, I have labeled this as coronary flow, and this is your coronary resistance. So if this is your diastole, we know in the diastole, the, the, the coronary perfusion takes place, but what we also know is this, it's the, during the diastolic phase of the, um, of the coronary circulation that the coronary, the capillary resistance goes down. And in systole, the capillary resistance goes up. So it is kind of an opposite direction. If you look at this here, as I said, in systole, the resistance, capillary resistance goes up, and these are just the numbers. And and in diastole, we see that the coronary flow is going up and the resistance will be going down. So with the IFR, basically what the computer does is looks at that diastolic period and then kind of correlates with the EKG. And during that, that millisecond of that diastolic phase where there is a maximum coronary flow and the capillary resistance, arterial resistance is down to zero, at that precise moment, the computer measures the, the pressure, the distal pressure, as we talked about in FFR. And it kind of averages over it over one, two, three beats. And it's basically looking at these R waves to kind of decide when it has to take that. I won't go into detail what are the numbers for the IFR, um, every vendor has validated that across, uh, with the FFR and, and they give you a number as if, if it reaches that number, that is significant. So either you do FFR or IFR, once it is positive, you have to believe it. Um, one of the common mistakes um, uh, sometimes we see is that people doing IFR and FFR uh, trying to see, oh, are they correlated or not? But now we know there is sufficient data and trials that have validated IFR. So instead of confusing yourself, doing one test, either it's IFR or FFR is sufficient. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, concerns, you can leave me a comment and be happy to discuss that.